All right. Cody Berman. What's going on, buddy? You know, I am just living life, man. Staying busy, building businesses, and just trying to live life to the fullest. Live life to the fullest. I love that, man. You and I were just having a conversation, and I want to start this uh, podcast off with a quote that I have heard before, and it's one of my defining quotes in life, and that is, choose your heart. You know, uh, life is hard. It's like marriage is hard. Divorce is hard. Choose your heart. Like fitness is hard. Being obese is hard. Choose your heart. And you and I were just talking about uh, the concept and topic of sacrifice when it comes to terms of financial freedom and having freedom in your life and having to take those couple of years to really plug in, get into the battlefield, get in the trenches and earn your freaking freedom for the remaining 60 to 70 to 80 years. I want to hear about this. I want to hear about your thoughts on this topic and what you did to sacrifice to set yourself up for freedom. It's a great question. I just think that people don't realize, and I might get you know bashed for this online, how easy it is to set yourself up financially for life if you're really strategic in the early years. So I love using the compound interest example and just investing in index funds because it's something that everybody can do. And so basically there's this rule, it's a math equation called the rule of 72. It says, take 72 divided by your expected rate of return and that's how long it's going to take your money to double. So I tend to lean on the conservative side when it comes to returns call it like 7% inflation, inflation adjusted over the past 100 years, your money's going to double about every 10 years. So mm-hmm. with that kind of background math, all you need to do is save up like $100,000 while you're young, could be 25 or 30, let's we'll use 25 because it's a flasher example. If you save up $100,000 by the time you're 25 invested in the stock market, and again, this is just like throwing it in the stock market, you don't have to do individual stock research, just put it in an index fund. By uh, 30, sorry, yeah, 25, you'll have 100,000, 35, 200,000, 45, 400,000, 55, 800,000. By 65, you have 1.6 million dollars. That's without doing anything. And I, I just don't think people get exposure to that type of math to how powerful compound interest can be. And just to clarify, in that example, that is without contributing another dollar. All you have to do is like accumulate a hundred thousand dollars in whatever way is possible before you have kids before life starts getting crazy like while you're young while you have energy while you have drive and that's it and if you can contribute more you'll have even more money so that's kind of how i've thought about it and i try to convince my friends some of them are tougher to convince than others but yeah man i'm just trying to like really inspire the youth to get started early make those sacrifices young like live like a college kid for as long as you can before your standard of living starts to increase and life becomes more expensive Cool. I love that, man. And that that's a great starting point that we always like kind of preach to people is, okay, this is this is what this is going to be over like the long run. So it's like time horizon. So the quicker that you start, then the faster that it compounds and the more that you get to benefit from this later on. But you and I aren't like that. We don't do that. <laughs> we sped things up a bit because we are uh, impatient, but uh, we are impatient with action and we are patient with results. So you hit financial freedom at 25, correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay, so you did not do that by saving up $100,000 <laughs> and waiting until you were 65. So I love that we're coming out the gate, covering every single base, but your story is super interesting to me because I am on Twitter where you and I both met, and I'm gonna have the pleasure of going on your podcast as well because you have a badass show, you and your co host and we'll talk about that in a bit. But we're on Twitter and there's a lot of people that talk about index funds and they talk about long-term horizon investing, which is amazing and it's sensational and there's a place for it. But there are also other opportunities and other ways to accelerate this journey. And so whenever I see cats like you where you're like, okay, 25, I'm out of this thing. And I'm 27 and I'm out of this and I'm filming this in South Brazil. Talk to the people, man. Talk to me, goose. Walk me backwards because you, I know you have multiple different sources of income, different revenue streams. Walk me backwards on this journey from when you discovered the concepts of financial independence to where you are today. Absolutely. So what I will say and the reason I give the example of like the index funds and saving up $100,000, and I know you and I, Brian, aren't like that, but 90 plus percent of people aren't cut out to be entrepreneurs. Now, I'm not saying that as a diss, but like it does take a hell of a yeah. lot of drive and motivation. I remember my corporate job, like I could literally get away with just like doing an hour of real work a day. And the rest of the day, I'm like researching different stuff, working on my side hustles, just like reading random articles. And that's fine. But as an entrepreneur, if you're working an hour of a day on like deep work on things that are actually going to move your business forward, then you aren't going to go very far at all. So with that yeah. caveat, that's why I mentioned the index funds thing. But for me, 
I kind of got into this whole world. I read the four hour work week when I was 19. So as a sophomore in college, I became obsessed with the idea of like building businesses and what Tim Ferriss called muses now more popularly called side hustles. But just the notion that your time and money didn't have to be linearly related was like groundbreaking to me because everyone I knew in my life, they worked this number of hours to get this paycheck. And some of them made more money per hour, some of them made less, but they were always working for a paycheck. They were, you know, the amount of hours they worked was a direct function of how much they earned in that paycheck. So once I kind of learned that it didn't have to be that way, you could build businesses, you could build passive income streams. Now where your time is kind of leverage, you have time leverage, now you can make more money with less time. So I became obsessed with that, started building businesses, had two failed businesses. One was a tutoring business, one was a specialty clothing company. Finally found some success with my third business, which was a disc golf manufacturing company. So many lessons learned from that business and I've since kind of effectively shut it down and I wouldn't recommend getting into physical products unless you're like really into it. But <laughs> lots of takeaways. So that's when I was like 19, started moving moving throughout college. But at that point, quite honestly, I, don't, I didn't think that entrepreneurship was like the thing that was going to get me there. I was really getting into the financial independence movement, like Mr. Money Mustache and those folks yeah. where you just make a ton of money in your early years. You invested all the index funds in like seven years. I was going to hit five. I'm like, perfect. Like I'll be 29. I'm going to get the sick corporate job in finance. Just like invested all in index funds, whatever. And kind of like what you just mentioned before, Brian, everything changed as I started getting more and more into the entrepreneurship community and just seeing people do amazing things, build these businesses. So I actually ended up quitting that corporate job seven months in. I was in commercial real estate lending, started focusing on the side hustles that I was currently building at that time, which was my blog, podcast. I was doing a bunch of freelancing. And I don't know if you want to stop me. I'll, I'll just go through it and then we can kind of put, uh, pick and choose what parts of the story we want to go through. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up in a, another minute. Um, then I started kind of focusing more on the passive income side hustles. So with freelancing, I was like trading all my time for money. Although I think one of the best ways to get bigger passive income side hustles is to fund those passive income side hustles with active income side hustles. So I was doing that for about a year. Then I started doubling my revenue year over year as I started focusing more time, more energy, more money into those passive income side hustles, like a blog, like online courses, like eBooks, like digital products. And ever, every year since then, so 2018 was kind of that like first year where I was like doing a ton of side hustles. I was only earning like $1,500 a month. The next year, 2019, I took entrepreneurship full time. I was making about eight grand a month. 2020 doubled again, about 17 grand a month. 2021, about 34 grand a month. And this year so far, I've been averaging 80 grand a month, just focusing on these super scalable passive income businesses. So that's basically me in a nutshell. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Friendship. 27 <laughs> friendship points, friendship, 27 <laughs> friendship points to Cody Berman. All right. So there are different levels to this game and I have the pleasure and privilege uh, of standing on the shoulders of a lot of giants, right? So the average guest on the show is normally kind of in that high seven to 10 figure range in their entrepreneurship journey. So I've got millionaires at the bottom and up to billionaires that are on this show. And it's insane to hear like how they think about things and how they go about it. And in this like whole concept and topic of entrepreneurship online, people talk about passive income, passive income, passive income. And they talk about how to generate as much as possible so that they can hit financial independence, have their passive cover their fixed expenses, and then they can have their freedom. But then here's the, here's chapter two to the book. What do you do with your freedom? Right? So that's where everyone yeah. drops the ball and then they haven't made it to that point yet. But what you're talking about is what I call passionate income. So you have taken to where you're like, okay, now I've earned my freedom and now I've found a way to attach my fulfillment to an active income source that prints so much capital that I can dump it into an exponential return in passive investing, right? That's exactly right, yeah. So let's hit it in two different spurts here. Let's hit on your active income side and then we'll hit on your passive um, income investments here. So let's go to your active side. So how, what are your streams right now of active income and how did you go about building those up? And then we'll get into the passive. So on the active income front, I'll say one thing that has changed a lot is I don't trade my, I don't trade my time for money anymore. So before Perfect. I would do something for X number of dollars per hour, I don't do any of that anymore. All of my active work, like the things I work on day to day are toward building a bigger vision, a bigger goal, a bigger business. So I'm not like, you know, someone's not paying me $500 an hour to coach them. Like I don't do any of that. It's all scalable stuff. So for me right now, what that looks like is building out our kind of digital product 
course slash all our products and we've been doing a bunch of partnerships. That company is called Gold City Ventures. I actually co-founded that with my business partner, Julie, back in 2019. Started getting a lot of success with our online courses, started producing eBooks and digital products, selling them on Etsy and Shopify. And the cool thing with that, and the reason I say I'm not like trading my time for money is it's, there are things where I'm building them once and then I can sell that thing that I created to an unlimited number of people. I kind of equate it sometimes to playing like a concert. Like a musician could play a concert for one person or to 100,000 people. It's no extra work for the musician to play that song, like regardless of the audience size. But if they have a bigger audience, they're going to have more fans. They're going to make more money. It's kind of the same thing with digital products. So really started like hammering that space and putting all of my time and effort into those like scalable products that I don't have to like, you know, rinse and repeat and like do one-on-one coaching and things like that. Um, So that's one of the things. The other one that I've been focusing a lot of time on is real estate. And so I'll say a lot of the active income part of real estate is in the beginning. It's like finding the right property. It's setting up the systems. It's all that stuff. But as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm building things strategically to then become more passive later on. So now, you know, it might take a couple dozen hours to find the right property, to get the right tenants in there, to just do all the things to set it up. But then once the property is all set up, whether it's like an Airbnb or long-term rental, I currently own both. Now it's like three or four hours of maintenance per month. And, you know, maintenance meaning my time, whether it's looking at like the balance sheet or the income statement or just like dealing with a random problem, a maintenance problem. And yeah, so those are probably the two things I've been spending most of my time on. Also, the podcast is, although we've outsourced a lot of it, now it's mostly just me doing the research and recording. Um, That's another part of like my active income or I guess income that I'm actually spending my time to earn. And let's see, am I missing anything? Honestly, honestly, just like a lot of other random little projects too, Brian, I'm sure we're very similar in that regard where like I just can't (laughs) shut it off. Like I have a million entrepreneurial ideas every single day and I'm like, okay, which one of these can I act on? And it's very few and far between that I actually have the energy, the time and the capacity to work on. But when I do, I go all in. I just Hmm. like go hard for three months on it. I love your concept of building scalable sources of active income because we all come from a background and you did that seven month spurt where we all come from a background of uh, trading time for money. And then we also equate uh, hard work to being deserving of having a lot of money. So that has been something that's been challenging for me is removing that relationship between hard work and more income. How's that, how's that process gone for you? Oh man, that's a tough one. Yeah. Cause growing Ha-ha, up, like you said, yeah, you just... thought, I'm podcast host too, brother coming at you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm prepared to answer anything though. I, I think for me, I used to just see money as like, again, this thing that you had to trade your time to get. And at this point, it's money almost doesn't feel real. I feel like once you figure out the money game and like all the richest people have figured out this money game, they, a lot of them don't have to work anymore. Like money is just like almost a side effect of the things that they're passionate about doing. And that's kind of what it is for me now. Like I'm not as excited about like seeing the numbers come in from a monetary standpoint, like just the fact that I can do what I want to do and see my impact and see the people that I'm affecting grow and the income kind of grow as a side benefit of that. I think it started to transform into something more of that for me because you know, I'm financially independent. I don't need any more money. Obviously money is nice and like money is a motivator and I'm pumped when I like, we have a course launch or when I'm doing something and I make a bunch of money from it. But I honestly think like money has now become more of a side benefit of the other things I'm doing rather than the main goal, which it was for like the years that I was grinding towards FI. A really good example of that and a, and a metaphor for that is that you are in this car and you're driving this car and you're building this machine and then it goes from that machine being designated and designed to create money. Now, instead, you're driving this car that you're having fun driving and you're going down this country road that you're seeing all these beautiful landscapes and you're having the time of your life. And then the money and the income is like the exhaust coming up. It's a byproduct. Absolutely. And I love what you, and yeah, I love what I you were we, talking uh, about. Go on. I was going to say, I know we mentioned Alex Hormozian. You know, he has his podcast, The Game. Like, that's kind of what business has become for me at this point. Like, it's fun. I love building businesses. I love getting into the data. I love figuring out what's going to work. I love figuring out lead gen. I love figuring out conversions. I love delivering an awesome product to people. It's become a game to me. And, you know, you can kind of check your high score based on the amount of money that you're bringing in, the people that you're impacting. So going back to what I was saying before, it's like the money is like a side benefit. It's kind of like, okay, you're doing this much impact based on you know this high score. Yeah, and it's so much fun because uh, when you realize that the fastest way to get what you want and to get where you want is to help enough other people 
get what they want and get what they where where they want, then you just do that at a scale, and then that 10x is your your journey and your portfolio. But there's another quote that gets brought to mind by what you're doing, and it's one of my mentors, David Osborne, that was on this show. If you guys are listening, um, David is the episode that is 100 million dollar advice on health, wealth, and self, and he has this uh, phrase that's I do, we do, they do. So he talks about the concept of you begin the business with through all this force and friction like you were talking about with your real estate or with making the online course. And then at that point, then you start to bring a team on board and then you teach the team how to manage this business. And then it's a team sport together and it's we do it. And then after that, there comes a point where it's time to exit and you move on to the next thing and then it becomes they do it. So I do, we do, they do. And I feel like that's what you're yeah. doing with all of your businesses, and I love it. Let's talk a little bit more about the real estate portion of that before we get into the passive side. Yeah, real quick before real estate, I just think that's so important and something that most entrepreneurs figure out too late. I mean, me, myself included. Yeah. I could have started outsourcing way earlier. I was always like, I can do this better than anyone else. Like, kind of, kind of cocky, but also like another part of that was I was super frugal, so I didn't want to pay someone else to do it when I could just take the thirty minutes to do it. So that was a huge shifting point for me when I started outsourcing like tasks that I didn't have to do, so I could focus on higher impact stuff. Uh, for my real estate journey, I had interviewed so many people on my podcast who had retired <laughs> crazy early. Some yeah. who I've become really good friends with, like my friends James and Emily, they retired at 27, 28, moved to Cyprus, like completely stopped working. And I was like, there's no reason I can't do that. So me and my fiance, Lauren, we just like started looking for properties. And I'm in Massachusetts, Massachusetts, where I am, didn't have like the best cash flowing deals, ended up jumping the border over to Connecticut. We bought our first two properties there, then ended up buying a couple up in Massachusetts. At this point, we have 11 long-term rentals and two Airbnbs, and we're currently doing our first flip. Man, it's been an absolute learning process. It's been a, like a really, really rewarding, and like I mentioned before, I'm always up for the next challenge. But man, like you don't know how much you don't know until you start doing it. No matter how many podcasts, <laughs> or books, or YouTube videos you watch, like there's always shit that you just don't know. Yeah. So uh, talk about your relationship with failure, because you said something in the beginning, and that ties in perfectly with you being smacked in the face with the Airbnbs and doing your first flips and stuff. But uh, also uh, a quote that you said that stood out before was how you failed at your uh, disc golf manufacturing business when you were 19. And you said it in such a way that um, I immediately was like, this is my person because you were just like, oh yeah, like I failed at that for sure. Duh. Okay. <laughs> Move, moving on to the next thing. Talk about your relationship with failure on your entrepreneurial journey and how you view it. Failure, as I see it, is just the next, the, the easiest way to get up the next rung. Like, it's just a stepping stone. Like, you know, you're trying to build these blocks, and every time a block falls in front of you, like, it just gets you up to the next level, the next level, and eventually you're where you want to be. Even though, you know, it might be slower than you want, and your business, your first business might not blow up, or the first thing you create might not be the best thing in the world, but you're not going to learn unless you just, like, do shit. And then figure out what was wrong with the thing that you created. Why didn't people want to buy it? Why didn't it work? And then go back and iterate and just use those lessons you learned on the next business or the next venture or the next product. So like I mentioned before, for me, that was realizing, you know what? Physical products kind of sucks. Like <laughs> I have yeah. to you know, create the inventory. I have to then package and ship and mm -hmm. worry with distribution. Like it was a whole thing. And now I talked about the concert example with digital products. I can create it once and play it for 10,000 people without any additional overhead, which is awesome. So that was kind of like a, a key realization that I learned from that specific failure. And I have just, I mean, I've, I've failed a bunch of times. Like we've sold some of our properties that we like purchased because we got super trigger happy in the first year of acquiring properties. We bought like 11 doors and I'm like, oh man, I'm like a rock star. And then we ended up selling five of those doors because it was like shitty tenants and not the best areas just because the cash flow looked nice. So I am just like constantly, you know, kind of beating learnings into myself by trying different things and making mistakes. But I honestly, I know for a fact that I wouldn't be where I'm at today without making those mistakes. So failure sucks in the moment, but if you can take, if you can zoom out and take like a five year or even a one year mm -hmm. view, you'll realize that failure is the fastest way to success. Yeah. And it's almost to the point where if you aren't failing, you aren't even trying, like you're not pushing your limits because if you are mm -hmm. just operating that safe little bubble zone, then yeah, like you may feel a little bit of discomfort, but you're never going to really fully put yourself out there. And I love another analogy of uh, going to the gym. You're not going to go to the gym just to get a little bicep pump, right? You're there to completely destroy and rip apart that muscle so that it literally reheals itself as a stronger form of its previous version. 
And that's what entrepreneurship is because we're just going against that grinding block over and over and over again. So I want to take a pivot here um, in a bit uh, to the passive side. But first, what is the – so you said you have about $80,000 coming in. Is that mostly from the active businesses with the courses, digital products, and cash flow from the real estate? Or is that a combination of the two? Oh, I lost you for a second, Brian. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, it was, or is that from a combination okay. of what? I lost you at the last okay, part. Okay. Cool. I'll just, I'll just start the question over and edit it back. I was like, so first, before we get into the passive side, I wanted to talk about that eighty thousand dollars that you have coming in. Is that through your active investments, just purely, or is that a combination of your active and your passive together? I think we'd have to define active versus passive because I think there's a lot of gray area here. Because, like I mentioned Let's before, I wouldn't consider like real estate active income. It's more like residual income. Like a lot of the work is done up front and then I'm making money on the back end. I think of active in income as like a lawyer or a doctor or someone who's like doing really high level coaching, someone who's literally trading their dollars for hours. I don't know, that's mm -hmm. just how I define it. But to answer your question, most of that, pretty much all of that is coming from a combination of digital products like courses and eBooks and printables and then real estate. That's like probably 90% of my income. How do you feel about the financial independence retire early community that gets irritated at people working still? <laughs> so I definitely have some gripes with the fire movement, although I got to give credit where credit's due because I don't think I would be where I'm at today without kind of discovering that community and just like seeing people spend intentionally and how you can retire at a really young age if you're frugal and kind of understand what to do on the income and investing side of the equation. But I think a lot of people in the FIRE movement don't focus enough on income generation and just like scaling your income. Because I've talked about this before, you can only frugal yourself to zero. And I mean, that's you living under a bridge, like eating the scraps that people throw over. You don't have health insurance. You don't have a house. You don't go out anywhere. Like to get to zero, you have to be like absolutely insane. But on the income front, if you're making like 40 grand a year, your your income is infinitely scalable. You could start a side hustle and double that to 80 or 160 or beyond. And so I think a lot of people in the FIRE movement, and there are some that do talk about this, but I don't think enough of them focus on the income side of the equation because especially with side hustles, entrepreneurship, it's infinitely scalable, man. So that would be one critique I have of the FIRE movement and its teachings. Yeah, and you mentioned Alex Hermosi, and he has a quote that says, if he has $10,000, he would invest in the S&P 500. <laughs> and so I was just like, I was like, come on, man. Even he was like, okay, yeah, you, you guys can punch me in the throat for this one. But uh, no, I completely agree. It's uh, people come to me and they ask me, you know, hey, I've got $5,000, $10,000. What should I invest in? And I say, you should invest in acquiring skills, right, to, in mm -hmm. to increase your income generation. And so I want to lead that into the next question, which I already have an idea of what the answer is, but I'm curious about your perspective. If you had all of your income sources go up in a fire like tomorrow and you had to build something from scratch all over again to be the fastest, you know, back to homeostasis financial mark that you could get, what's the first thing that you would build up? Would you get back into the real estate or would you focus on the online stuff? I get more fired up about the online stuff. I could honestly go either way in this question. I love the way you framed it, though. And something we talked about before we hit record was going back to Alex Ramosi. He's getting a lot of shout outs in this episode, huh? He should be dude, sponsoring this thing Alex, or something. Come on our shows, <laughs> dude. Come on our shows, homie. But it was his quote, and then Sam Parr, they say, do interesting shit. And yeah. I think that one side hustle or just business model that people sleep on is do something really interesting that's like buried in a niche. Like the riches are in the niches. That is like one of the truest sayings that I can say about entrepreneurship and business building. I would get really good at something really specific. And as I get really good about, around that thing, whether it's you know making money online or something else, it could be even like something about like fitness or it could be something about relationships. It could be something about mindset. It doesn't matter. Get really good at a hyper niche thing that a lot of other people aren't doing. Then start to create content around that thing and you'll start to gain a following super fast. You'll be able to productize your knowledge by creating courses and eBooks and digital products and things like that. And it's super scalable going back to that concert thing. It's like you create it once. If you create the right thing in the right niche, it's just like infinitely scalable. If you can sell it to 10,000 people, you're going to be hella rich. So that's probably what I would do. I would get some and what, what's what's uh let's take the scenario even one step further and all my skills led on fire too so i'm like starting back at ground zero without any Ooh. of my existing skills 
I would try to learn a really niche skill and just like literally grind my ass off and document the process along the way, get really good at that thing, like put in so much more work than other people that they have to look to me for advice because I have put in so many more hours than them. And then I kind of build a whole community around this super niche skill that I created and start to monetize around that and become the guy. And for the people who are like, well, I don't want to be in like a super deep niche, you can start to niche up as you get bigger and bigger. But I think the mistake a lot of people make is like they create a personal finance you know, social media presence, and then they just like try to sell like a money course. That's not going to work. Like there's mm-hmm. other people that are doing a money course way better than you. But if you become like the mega backdoor Roth guy for single males from 20 to 40, now you have a niche. Now everyone's going to come to you for that. So it's a lot easier to niche up than to, you know, start, start really t- high and get like a foothold and then niche down into other stuff. Dude, I love that you say that because, um, all right, guys, for all of you listening, I'll give you a teaser, spoiler alert. Like, you guys all know that I'm working on something for you. It's not ready for official launch yet, so sit tight, guys. But uh, there's already, like, 50 of you that are signed up, so I have to announce, like, something. So I guess this will be the episode that we do it. Um, I am over here in this uh, beach house in South Brazil uh, to film uh, content for a course in a community that I'm building, Right. And exactly what you just said is 100% true to where people will focus on just a very generic problem to solve, but they don't, they act, most of the time they haven't even actually solved it themselves, right? <laughs> so that's a, yeah. whole other, that's a whole other can of worms. But for me, my process of leaving my W-2 and leaving corporate America, uh, you have the financial side of it, of course. Obviously, you have to get the passive income in place to cover your expenses so that you can leave uh, But there's also a lot of identity uh, shifts that have to occur. There's a lot of mindset stuff. There's a lot of emotional battles that you have to go through um, to be able to make it to the other side. And it's a difficult and dicey process. And so I'm working on that and producing videos and content and training on that as much as the financial side. I'm curious, has there ever been a period of your journey where you have felt that friction, maybe in the beginning a little bit, probably not so much now, or is that still the case? So when we launched our side hustle courses back in 2019, it was kind of exactly the model I was just telling you. Like it was stuff that me and my business partner, Julie, had already done and we've already made good money from it. We launched a blogging course, a freelancing course, and then like a digital products course teaching people how to create and sell printables and digital downloads on Etsy. So what was wrong, and for the people who are like really astute listeners, What's wrong with those three courses? Well, the freelancing course is freelancing in general. We're competing with like the biggest names who are freelance influ- influencers. And so like getting those people into our ecosystem and trusting us over like, you know, the huge name freelancers was near impossible. And then with the blogging course as well, like, you know, we had decent success with our blogs. We had made over six figures, but then there's like these seven and eight figure bloggers selling these courses who are just dominating the general blogging space. So that course didn't really work out. And so the one that did really work out was this like course on creating and selling digital products on Etsy because it was like a super niche thing. It was like kind of nested under the side hustle space, which is like a subspace of money. And so that one worked out really, really well. And that's something that, you know, I'm only talking about this from personal experience. I learned along the way is like, we just couldn't battle with the big dogs on the blogging and freelancing course. We since shut those down. If I were to redo it now, like I would focus on one really specific part of blogging or one really specific freelance skill, because then we'd have a lot, a much larger chance of competing in those arenas. So that has definitely like, that was a really hard lesson for me to learn because we spent, oh my God, hundreds of hours on each of those courses, thousands of dollars in video editors, and now they're just toast. <laughs> no one's in them anymore. We're not marketing them anymore, but the learning lessons were invaluable. And now we're taking that knowledge and like using that to build other courses and scale our course and just take things to the next level. 